Hello students, welcome once again to Chem is Try. In this video, we are considering question three from WASI 2023 Elective Chemistry. Question three A, I, state Hess's law of constant heat summation. Now the Hess's law states that the enthalpy of the a reaction, the enthalpy of a reaction is independent on the reaction path. So the total enthalpy of a reaction doesn't matter where we are going to pass before we end the reaction. So far as it starts from A and ends with C, whether we went through B before getting to C or moving from A directly to C, we are still going to get the same total enthalpy change. So the total enthalpy change of a reaction is not dependent on the path of the reaction. I, I. Sulfur 6 oxide is formed according to the following reaction. 2SO2 gas combining with 1 mole of oxygen gas, reversible sign, to form 2 moles of SO3 gas. Delta H of the reaction is negative 1,900 kilojoules per mole. This is a reversible reaction. That means as the reactants combine to form products. The product also breaks down to form the reactants back. And this reaction, when it goes straight forward from the reactant side to the product side, it releases energy of 1,900 kilojoules per mole. Now, state and explain the effect of increase in pressure on the alpha equilibrium position of the reaction. Now, this is going to be based on the Le Chatelier's principle. When we talk about increase in pressure, just count the number of moles of gases on the reactant side and the number of moles of gases on the product side. So on the reactant side, we have two moles of SO2 then we have one mole of O2. So total mole of gas at the reactant side is three. Then at the product side, the total moles is two. You can see two moles of SO3 here. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, when you increase the pressure, the reaction position will shift to where the moles of gas is small or is minimal. So we have three moles at the reactant side, which is our left. And we have two moles at our product side, which is our right. So since two is less than three, the equilibrium position will shift to where the moles of gas is small. That is the product side. And the product side, when you stand here like this, the product side is our right, and the reactant side is our left. So the equilibrium position will shift to the right where the moles of gas is minimum. I hope you got it. Good. Then, beta, equilibrium constant of the reaction. Please, apart from temperature, concentration, pressure, volume, they all have no effect on the equilibrium constant. So there is no effect. Very easy, huh? Then, I, I. Sorry, I, I, I. What would be the effect of an increase in temperature on the equilibrium position of the reaction? Now, here is where things get a little dicey, but I have a trick for you. You see, look at delta H. Delta H is negative. That means heat is released in the reaction. So we can consider heat as part of the product. So as SO2 and O2 combine to form SO3, 1,900 kilojoules of heat is released into the environment. So heat is part of our product. So since there are a lot of heat at our product side, when we increase the temperature again, what will have to happen? Some of the heat have to move to the reactant side. thereby reducing the heat at the product side. That is the trick. So 
you have to look at the delta H value. If it is negative, consider heat to be part of your product. If it is positive, you are going to consider heat as part of your reactant. And nobody wants stress. So if you increase the temperature, you are stressing the system. So if the heat is at the product side and you increase the temperature, you are stressing the product. So some of the heat have to move to the reactant side, which is our left. If delta H is positive and you have um, temperature increased, that means the heat is part of our reactant. So when you increase the temperature, you will stress the reactant. So some will have to push to the product side. Let's try and put this in perspective. So what will be the effect of an increase in temperature on the equilibrium position of the reaction? The forward reaction is exothermic. That means the backward reaction is endothermic. So increasing the temperature will shift the equilibrium position to the left, which is our reactant side. So let's consider it once again and put our answers there. So equilibrium position of the reaction, it will shift to the right where the number of moles of gas is minimum. Then the equilibrium constant of the reaction, we said pressure has no effect on it. So no effect on the equilibrium constant. Then with the III, we said the forward reaction is exothermic. Thus, the backward reaction is endothermic. So, increase in temperature will shift equilibrium position to the left, which is the reactant side. Then B, I, explain why the production of aluminum may be considered as an environmentally friendly process, but electrolysis of sodium chloride is not. This is electrolysis, eh? And remember, we said that when we are performing electrolysis on alumina, alumina is aluminum oxide. At the cathode, we are going to produce aluminum metal. And at the anode, we are going to produce oxygen gas. So we are producing aluminum metal and oxygen gas. So the oxygen gas will be released into the environment. And as you know, oxygen gas is not toxic. It is environmentally friendly. Sometimes, too, the, the, the anode, which is made up of carbon, reacts with the oxygen to form carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide is not all that toxic to the environment. As compared to what will happen during the electrolysis of sodium chloride. Now, the electrolysis of sodium chloride will yield sodium metal and chlorine gas. And this fluorine gas released into the atmosphere is very toxic. That is why the electrolysis of sodium chloride is not environmentally friendly. It is because chlorine gas will be released into the environment. But in the case of aluminum, it is oxygen gas or where still carbon dioxide. But the carbon dioxide is not as toxic as chlorine gas. So the electrolysis of aluminum is quite environmentally friendly as compared to that of sodium chloride. I, I part of the question says, name two major factors which would favor the siting of an aluminum smelter in a country. 
So imagine we want to set up a place where you are going to work on aluminum and extract aluminum from bauxite. What are the factors you are going to consider? One, where we are going to site our industry should have an abundance of the bauxite, which is the ore of the aluminum. So we should have raw materials available. That's where we are going to site our industry. Then two, there should be availability of electricity. Because the electrolysis of alumina is done by use of direct current. Therefore, we need more of the what? Electricity. So it's either electricity is readily available or it is cheaper so that it will aid in our production of aluminum. These are the two factors we can consider. The C part of the question says that explain briefly why an aqueous solution of ion three ions when added to sodium triosocarbonate four produces carbon four oxide. Now, when you did acid base and salt, you learned that there's this property of acids. The moment they react with a metallic carbonate, sodium trihydrocarbonate 4, potassium trihydrocarbonate 4, calcium trihydrocarbonate 4, calcium tri uh, uh, ammonium trihydrocarbonate 4, copper 2 trihydrocarbonate 4, they are all carbonates of metal, with the exception of the ammonium, actually. Yeah. When an acid reacts with any of these trihydrocarbonate 4 salts, you are going to form a salt, water, and produce a gas. And that gas is what we call carbon-4 oxide, the one we normally know as carbon dioxide. So if ion-3 ions are reacting with sodium trihydrocarbonate 4 and we are producing carbon-4 oxide, it definitely tells you that the ion-3 ions are serving as acids in the reaction. But how come ion-3 ions is said to be an acid? Lewis's concept is one reason. Lewis said, an acid is an electron pair acceptor. And from that, we deduce that all cations are Lewis acids. Another reason is the fact that when these ion three ions undergo hydrolysis by reacting with water, this is water, what it does is it will break the hydrogen and the hydroxyl bond in water. This is positively charged. This part is partially positive, and this part, okay, let's say this part is positive, this part is negative. What will happen is, when this bond breaks, this water bond, the hydrogen hydroxyl ion bond, the moment it breaks, the ion will react or combine with the what? Hydroxyl ions to form ion 3 hydroxide. Then hydrogen ions should be in excess in the solution. Therefore, ion 3 ions in solution will become acidic because it will produce excess hydrogen ions. We can balance this equation by putting uh, um, our 3 over here, uh, our 4 over here. Huh? by putting our tray over here. Huh? Then we put our tray over here. This is the balanced equation. So when ion tray ions undergo hydrolysis or when it interacts with water molecules, it produces a solution with excess hydrogen ions. And when there are hydrogen ions in solution, what happens? The solution becomes acidic. So this ion tray ions are serving as an acid reacting with sodium trihydrocarbonate 4. So definitely, we are going to produce carbon 4 oxide. The last question. A mixture of 8 grams of hydrogen gas. So we have hydrogen gas. Mass is 8 grams. And 32 grams of oxygen gas. We have oxygen gas. The mass is 32 grams. Has a total pressure of 
100 kilopascals. So total pressure, 100 kilopascals at a specific temperature. Calculate the partial pressure of oxygen at that temperature. The partial pressure of oxygen gas is given as amount of oxygen gas in moles divided by the total amount, which is the amount of oxygen gas in moles plus the amount of hydrogen gas in moles times the total pressure. But we were given just the masses of the gases. So let's try and convert them from grams to moles. So hydrogen gas has a molar mass of 2 gram per mole. So amount of hydrogen gas is 8 grams divided by 2 gram per mole. And that will give us 4 moles. The amount of oxygen gas is equal to the mass, which is 32 grams, divided by the molar mass of oxygen. 16 times 2, that is 32 gram per mole. And that gives us 1 mole. So the total amount will be amount of hydrogen gas plus amount of oxygen gas. That will be 4 plus 1, 5 moles. So we now have our amount of oxygen gas to be 1 mole, our total amount to be 5 moles, and we have been given the total pressure already as 100 kilopascals. So we just fix our values inside. So we have our partial pressure of oxygen gas equal to amount of oxygen gas, which is 1, divided by amount of total amount, which is 5, times our total pressure, which is 100 kilopascals. And our answer will be 20 kilopascals. That's it. Thank you.